Thank you everybody for being here. Marisa, thank you so much for accepting sure. to talk. The, at this moment, we are so extremely busy doing so many things. Um, and I wanted to say that normally what we do is we ask you to place any questions you have in the chat, but maybe there is also a chance for you to ask a question in person at the, at the end of, Marisa will talk for about 40 to 45 minutes. So there will be about 15 minutes for questions uh, and answers. So this is a lecture titled Approaching Curatorial Practice and the Future with Care, Support and Hope. Uh, well, I'm particularly um, excited to, to that Marisa is here today because this word care, support and hope, they are truly, um, they truly embody what Marisa stands for. We've been collaborating on a project now for some years and, and I know how she really stands for this. This is a lecture from the ASU LAGMA Navigating Change Museum's public lectures and it's part of the ASU LACMA Fellowship Program that was funded in 2018 in partnership with the, with the Los Angeles County Museum of Art with the aim to culturally diversify the staff and leadership of art museums in the United States. Now the program is growing. We have some of the fellows that are participating, some of the incoming fellows that are coming. So the uh, LACMA is participating, the Paris Art Museum in Miami, the Herb Museum in Phoenix, the ASU Art Museums, the Phoenix Art Museum, the Memphis Brooks Art Museum. So it's very exciting for us that it's growing because what we, the idea is that you know, it grows into a network of people that are coming out of this program potentially to be able to collaborate and grow insights to truly exercise change. I'm not going to go into a lot of details about Marisa de Toro's biography because one of the purposes of this talk is that she's going to actually discuss her experience. Um, so a bio wouldn't make a lot of sense, but what I do want to say is that she is a person the body in her life and in our professional life works towards the promotion of advocacy for diverse narratives within art. Um, she's assistant director of exhibitions at program the next. Um, I never know how to pronounce next uh, even. <laughs> next even, sorry. <laughs> so these um I'm going to just let Marisa talk who we want to hear today. So thank you so much for being here, Marisa. And welcome everybody. Thank you, Cecilia, for this invitation. Um, really honored to speak with the ASU community, Phoenix, Arizona, and other fellows and people abroad. So um yeah, so my name is Marisa Del Toro. Um I'll, let me just go ahead and get going with my screen sharing. Um and as Cecilia mentioned, there'll be some like um, time for questions at the end and discussion. So um, my presentation today, my lecture is more about my biography and showing about how I arrived at this point, how um, my curatorial practice involves care, support, and hope. Um, and with that, I start with like my origin. Um, so I'm born and raised in Riverside, California, um, specifically in Paris, California, the city. And this is the land of the Bayou Coisham, the, the Senyo and Kola people. Um, for me, it's always been important to acknowledge the land I'm standing on um, because it's it's what's housed me and um, where I grounds me. Um, I'm also a Sagittarius. Um, moon and rising, which I've heard is complicated, but we're working through it. Pisces, um, forward facing. I received my bachelor's in art history from the University of California, Riverside, my master's in art history, the University of Texas at San Antonio. And my art background, it originally started in the art. Yeah, but I'm, it's, it's muted. It's not like a collaborative Zoom. Oops, sorry. It's okay. <laughs> oh, no worries. Yeah. Um, if you like, just jump in, just um, mute yourself if you can, but it's all good. Um, so yeah, my background is in art of the ancient Americas. Um, I was interested in the history of the Americas and learning more about um, my own like in, like heritage and where I come from and 
um, tradition. So that's why I started with that area of expertise. And then I moved from there to, to contemporary art, specifically to Latin America and the US. Um, my previous work has included working at the Phoenix Art Museum, Santa Barbara Museum of Art, the Getty Research Institute, UTSA Art Gallery, and the Smithsonian Latino Center. Um, as Cecilia mentioned, I currently work as, as Assistant Director of Programs and Exhibition at Next Haven, which is in New Haven, Connecticut, which is on the land of the Quinnipiac people. Um, I'm also the Director of Communications for Museums Moving Forward. Um, as Cecilia mentioned, I have a lot of projects and I'm working on that self-care to make sure I'm balanced and grounded. So it's in progress. And then here is my little sidekick, Pepita. Um, she has been with me on this journey um, for six of the eight years of my curatorial practice and we are continuing to keep going. Um, okay, so I first started curating when I was in graduate school, um, getting my master's. And uh, it wasn't until my professor, Dr. Scott Scherer, asked, um, well, I don't, he didn't really ask, he kind of just forced me into it, <laughs> into co-curating two exhibitions with him. Um, you know, my track, my track at that time was that I would be become an art professor, art history professor. Um, but he advised me and really supported me in finding a different field of interest. And that sparked my interest with curatorial practice. Um, this is one of the first projects I worked on. And it's one that I, means dearly to me because um, the title of it is The Uncertainty of a Life and Security of Veterans Back Home, which looks at um, the reality and struggle that veterans who have been deployed into combat uh, overseas, um, even just into military bases across the world, um, the globe, how they transition um, coming back home to regular life and how for many of them, it is a struggle. Um, and the exhibition involved photography, um, some mixed media art, uh, installation, um, paintings, and much of the topics were kind of political in tone in the sense that they had some anti-war sentiments and feelings, but they were also very open about the realities of being placed in um, in the military and in war zones and what that does to a human. And it really opened space for these artists to share their experiences, but also for the community too, um, because I didn't realize this until I moved to San Antonio, but San Antonio has, it's a big military city. Um, I don't think it's really well known for that. Um, or, you know, the Alamo kind of takes that over, but, um, so it, we had some sessions where we um, had some group talks with um, veterans from on campus and off campus who came and you know saw the exhibition. And for me, this exhibition was important because um, one of the lessons I learned from this was um, that my mentor gave to me was that um, in the process of curation, you always have to kind of take a step back and listen and look and see who's a part of the conversation and who is not, who is there and who is missing, who needs to be added, who needs to, um, whose voice needs to be heard a little bit more. And that was coming, you know, that was because like we had created, I had done this research, created this checklist and, you know, it was a great checklist, but also there was like a lot of men and we're like, okay, there's more than men in the military. So we need to make sure like it's, showing a fuller picture. And that's where we made sure to also had, have the voice of women too involved in this. Um, and I think that's an important part of curation um, that it's important for the curator to understand their role um, and the responsibility they hold with curating exhibitions for the public, but for the artists as well. Um, you know, what is the conversation they're curating and connecting with everyone? Um, uh, and is it, you know, is it, is it legible, is it accessible, but also is it telling as much of the full story as possible? You know, some exhibitions aren't able to have everyone under the sun, but just making sure that you kind of have like a well-rounded um, conversation, especially if it's one based on topic. Um, so that was like my big takeaway from that exhibition. Um, I have also 
since then and in between me working at different museums, um, I worked independently. Um, and this was um, via like open calls, um, friends kind of asking if I want to curate their gallery or, you know, just do a pop up here and there. Um, so that's what I always feel like everyone asks me, like, how did I get into this? Like, how did I continue to curate? Um, was because I kept going. I wanted to keep telling stories. And that's what I think curating is. So I just try to find avenues of where I could tell stories, um, either it be submitting two open calls for curatorial proposals, um, such as the Mission Cultural Center for Latino Arts in San Francisco, um, or, you know, working with a friend at Pain Sugar Gallery to um, curate, co-curate an exhibition. Um, and also, uh, you know, again, open call for Cruise in the Horizon, which I'll discuss in a, the next slide. Um, but I also want to note too that my practice is um, involves collaboration in many ways, such as co curating. Um, but uh, I am also like a advocate for museum workers, and one of the projects um, that I'm working on is called Museums Moving Forward. We're a data-driven initiative um, to support greater equity and accountability in our museum workplaces um, via coalition building, research, and advocacy. So we are a group of predominantly curators um, working to use our positions and voices to leverage that, um, the infrastructure of art museums to change. We want to build bridges between the various stakeholders within a museum um, that often is sometimes hard um, for certain departments to access, um, you know, like thinking about education and like sometimes we all like in certain institutions, it becomes siphoned and we don't talk to each other. And that was what I've always kind of made sure to do my best at, or at least try to get to know people um, in the many departments that I work with, because um, it's not just curatorial um, offices, it's it's everyone. Um, also, so we build bridges, we um, look at what is happening in the field of our, you know, of our museums and the obstacles to equity and see how we can build new models. And we do that by having convenings, discussions with other curators, um, other museum worker field, um, groups such as like a mass action we've collaborated with last year and we'll be collaborating with them again later this year to speak about um, how can we work collectively to make sure that these changes become implemented that we know need to happen. Um, and that's where we like, you know, again, create an actionable, sustainable platform um, for change. Um, so this past year, we also uh, released a data study um uh and that will be um the findings will be released in june and it, the data study was the first of its kind because it assessed um responses from museum workers you know not just from hr and director level but from staff members on what it was like to work in the museum are you getting paid enough um, what is your pay range are you happy have you um encountered um any form of hardship or harassment that you, you know, so those kind of questions that haven't really been um, taken down or surveyed. Um, you know, we've had numerous um, surveys um, counting how many artists, um, diverse artists are presented in exhibitions, which is still very low. Um, but, you know, we've never really assessed how it is to, for the staff workers who are actually making the museum museums work and run every day. Um, so collaboration is also a very key component of this. And again, it's like a through line of taking the time to listen to the collaborators and really try to see eye to eye on what's being conveyed and um, also move through like any misunderstandings that could occur. Okay. Um, so Cruising the Horizon New York uh, was originally an exhibition that was planned as part of my curatorial fellowship while I was at the Phoenix Art Museum. Um, the original vision was, um, I always like to say it was inspired by Leslie Martinez. Um, their images 
here of their painting that I um, use for the catalog. Um, it was a conversation about the work of Jose Esteban Munoz's um, writings and um, uh, book, Queer Ut um, Cruising um, Utopias. Um, and just about how it was inspiring to be feel like to be seen and to be recognized in the way that um, just like as they are. And um, unfortunately due to the pandemic, this exhibition did not come to fruition, um, but it came to fruition in a different way. Um, uh, I was laid off from the museum um, along with other 104 other staff members. And um, after that, you know, I took some time off and away from like curating and just like, I think we are in a moment of um, stasis where we're just trying to figure things out in life um, in that period of 2020. Um, but I felt it was still important to kind of get this um, exhibition out there because of the artists um, that I had began working with already that I wanted to their work to be seen. and. Um, in any which way I could. So I proposed this to the Latinx project through their open call. And uh, the director of the Latinx project, Arlene Davila, um, was open to having it in, um, at NYU. Uh, because of the ongoing pandemic, it didn't come to fruition into a gallery space, but it did come to fruition in a digital sphere. And I still think that is like a beautiful poetic way of thinking about how, um, you know, thinking of new worlds that um, Jose Esteban Mios is, you know, quotes here, um, kind of envision, you know, um, that through all like the hardships, like we still imagine new different worlds that um, of just how we can exist. So I'm gonna share, let me see if I can get to my okay so this is this exhibition cruising the horizon new york um changed a little bit from my original vision it was focused on combining um the theory of jose espanol's work with also thinking about artists who really use um craft practice and methodologies um to create works that um, speak about how they exist in a then and there, um, you know, and like a future way, uh, kind of an existence that is not for this current time and period. Um, and it speaks to a lot of um, identity uh, um, categories of like not fitting in because of gender sexuality or majoritarian um, identity politics. Um, but, you know, for these artists, it was important, like, this is the work that speaks to them and is referencing who they are. Um, so I worked with, um, at the time, uh, the um, manager for the Latinx project, Nicole Moreno, to design this website. Um, and the idea is, like, you would access it as if you're walking into the gallery space, um, encountering these works. Um, as you're walking through. Um, so the exhibition was just focused on how these artists created points of um, radical imaginations of their existence of who they are without any boundaries, restrictions or conditions um, uh, holding them back. And um, so here we have Amarillis the Jesus Molsky, um, her beautiful, um, works on paper um, that kind of like give a sense of like a transformative um, movement. And this is where like, you know, the idea is like your work walking through this exhibition, encountering these um, paintings that take you through a, an, a moment of a time that is being transformed in front of us. And then we encounter Leslie Martinez's work where they use um, discarded materials specifically from I believe their mother's um, nurse jobs of rags and like um, hospital, um, like uh, uh, hospital material that um, is just like surplus. 
and you incorporate that into creating these like textured survey um, surfaces on their paintings where pools of blood, um, not blood, painting <laughs> paints um, take um, place. And it's just, it creates this like bodily moment of this painting that comes to life. Um, and for me in thinking about this exhibition, it was showing like from Marmarillis's work to this like actual transformation of a body um, that is followed up with the various other artists, such as Zandra Ibarra, um, Amy Bravo, Moises Salazar, um, kind of reconfiguring the body again in different ways. Um, and then taking another different tone of like moving from their work to Marco da Silva, looking at more of how non-figurative um, works are still referential to the body in certain ways that are not always clear to the viewer, but um, in the subtext of the work. For Marco, their work is about um, past lovers and friendships that they've had. Um, these are the flags of um, these the individuals that they've met and had encounters with and relationships with. And thinking about how Sydney Mallory's work is also referencing the body in a non-figurative way, um, specifically tying um, wood with like elements of, of rope and yarn, um, creating this hard and soft um, play with sculpture. Um, the exhibition was uh, different in the sense that it was digital, but it was still great that it took um, flight. And I think for me, it was important to get this work out there because I also produced a catalog with this. and in the sense that producing a catalog is vital for artists to have in their um, like CV, but also portfolio. Um, in this world of, in the art world, you know, there is this kind of collateral that you need to show that you're valid, even though you already are valid. Um, but I think that is like one of the things for me that is important about writing about artists too, making sure that, um, you know, there is some form of documentation to show like um, that this happened. There's an archive now of Angel and Mujero being in dialogue with each other um, and these two distinct works um, next to each other. Okay. So um, as I continue on with my journey of curating, um, so that Cruise in the Horizon happened during the pandemic. Um, period of life. And then after that, um, I got the opportunity to move to New Haven to be a curator fellow at Next Haven. And Next Haven is co-founded by Jason Price and Titus Kafar. Um, they have nine fellowships total, seven studio fellows, and two curatorial fellowships at each year for a 10-month program. And it's the opportunity to come and be in dialogue with artists, other curators, other creative minds um, to work with each other in just creating, making dreams happen and visions happen. And um, it, for me, it's also, it was also a wonderful opportunity too because the program involves um, a series of sessions that we have in dialogue with Titus, uh, Jason, uh, other uh art world leaders um, uh, and experts, um, you know, that discuss, you know, what is it like to engage with the gallery or market? Um, kind of giving the tools and knowledge on how to best prepare um, artists, curators and creatives um, to navigate the art world, especially if you are thinking about entering the market or gallery spheres, um, which can be daunting, especially for, um, black and brown, um, indigenous people of color, you know, I don't come from an art world background. I come from a working class, middle-class family where I'm the first in my family to be in the arts. So a lot of the things I've learned is just through mentorship and sharing knowledge. And that is why I was excited really to come to Next Haven to be, um, in dialogue with everyone. Um, so this exhibition, Let Them Run Freely, um, was part of the curatorial fellowship that I co curated with, with um, my amazing co curator Jamila Hinson. Um, and it involves the work of Hong Hong, who we see here in the paper, large scale paper painting, and then mm -hmm. Daryl D'Angelo Terrell, we see here in the background photographer. 
Um, and for this project, we commissioned them to come to New Haven. Um, we wanted to make a two person exhibition and commission them to come to New Haven to create site, create work on site or in New Haven. Um, and that was like, honestly, a great experience to have with each of these artists. Um, you know, it was still in 2021 and it was kind of still touch and go with the pandemic. And so it was like kind of interesting in how we like cautiously worked together, but it was exciting to um, be part of their process, um, you know, helping Hong, Hong at times like set up um, the gallery space so that she could make her artwork um, on the ground, which is very different from her traditional practice um, because she makes eight foot by 11 foot um, paper paintings using that size of a decal outside in the summer. But we invited her in the winter. So she had to adjust her practice to work on the floor going piece bill my piecemeal to create this still eight foot by 11 foot um, painting of paper. Um, so it was great in the sense that we could um, work with each other through these challenges that we've encountered, you know, and then um, to be part of Daryl's process too, of where they go to specific sites relevant to black identity, black life, black joy, black history, um, black tragedy, whatever it may be, and take, um, as we see here, kind of like this background um, image of Jamila under the gold sequin cloth, while Daryl is like, you know, testing the shot to make sure we that he, they can get the the beautiful horizon line and sunlight in there. Because what they do is like they go under themselves the gold sequin cloth and make these beautiful gestures with their body. Um, to capture in um, a, a, it's not time-lapse, um, uh, photography to get this kind of single still um, image that we see here. Um, and the idea of the show was premised on creating portals. Um, this is a portal for Darrow to a different time and place at this specific site that is um, important for Black identity in life. Um, and the portal is the idea is that the portal could be accessed by black individuals and specifically only black individuals or brown um, individuals too. And then Hong's work is a portal as well. We can kind of see a door here. And the concept of her work is it's a portal to her family and connection in China where um, she had left as a young child. Um, you know, so kind of building that, those are both like these connections to a different time and space. Um, so it was very beautiful in the sense that I think in the midst of the pandemic, we had this moment to kind of just breathe and reflect on where we just came through um, collectively. And for this project, we also collaborated with um, some amazing jazz musicians, uh, amazing um, uh yoga um, performer um, in here in New Haven to kind of have this moment of meditation as well. Um, as part of Next Haven, we also co-curated the culminating exhibition uh, that was at Sean Kelly Gallery. And this was really exciting. It was also very crazy at the end too, um, but it was wonderful. You know, you spend 10 months with these artists going in their studios almost daily sometimes, bugging them, them bugging you to work on their artist statements, bios, and you really get to know the artists that um, are here at Next Haven and Fellowship. And you really see their pro their their practice like deepen, um, transform, or just become more confident in where they, where they entered, you know? Um, you know, we here's Africana so Karnan's work um, in the downstairs, the video. And it was just really great to have this moment um, to carry it with Jamila, this final project for the exhibition and to see all of the work of these artists in dialogue with each other. Um, yeah, Sean Kelly. Um, so my current project that I have up right now is that Washington, near Washington Square Park um, for the Latinx project at NYU. It's 
titled Behind the Cloud, Interrogating Digital Technologies, is co-curated with Alex Santana. Um, it closes May, I believe, May 14th. So there's still time to check it out if you're in New York. Um, but for this exhibition, it was really amazing opportunity for me to um, work with Alex. We had known each other for several years since our time at the Smithsonian. Um, and we had both been wanting to work together. So as Arlene Davila invited us to guest curate this exhibition for the fifth year anniversary of the Latinx project. And um, it was a wonderful opportunity for us to do that where we looked at the current technology of artificial intelligence, um, uh, surveillance, communication infrastructures that monitor us on the daily without kind of like us really recognizing it. And looking, we found artists, um, included artists who are looking at these concepts and like kind of pulling them apart and interrogating them. Like for instance, we have Michael Menchaca's work here, who is very like critical of um, contemporary tech technologies um, and social media um, companies such as Twitter, Facebook, um, uh, Google, Amazon. And this is their giant poster um, that is uh, showing their, um, like as an ad for their upcoming opera that they're working on currently. And the opera will be focused on um, kind of like a contemporary vision of like what is currently happening, but putting it within the context of um, history of colonization and specifically of like the colonization of the Southwest, um, referencing how you know, Elon Musk and um, SpaceX is currently colonizing Brownsville, Texas with their, their um, occupation of the land. Um, and yeah, they're very, it's a very interesting piece and very fun and exciting to look at. Um, I also wanted to mention and talk about Chicana Yoax Body. Um, this is an upcoming exhibition that is co-created with Cecilia. Um, myself and Gilbert Vicario that we've been working on for, I believe, four years, Cecilia. Um, and, you know, I think this one really shows like the true collaboration that we've had um, for this project and endearing support that we we wanted this exhibition to happen. Um, because I think just due to the pandemic, again, um, it has its ups and lows, you know, and changes and transformations, but we're really excited for it to premiere at the Cheech in Riverside, California, my home city. Um, so, um, and it focuses on how the Chicanx body, specifically the brown body, is, is, is used and envisioned by artists as a site of uh, protest, joy, um, reclamation, an agency um, via experimental and conceptual methods such as um, photography here that we see um, by uh, Ricardo Valverde where he's painted over or Patsy Valdez kind of performances that um, she photographed um, or the cue signs here by Vera Mahano, Amy Brown and um, Kari Ovik and how they kind of envision the Chicanx body and transform certain stereotypes and tropes of identity into a more, um, I think, fuller idea of what being Chica Chicanx is, um, you know? And that's also specifically, we have um, referencing to Rafa Esparza's who is one of their new works, his one of his new works that he premiered at Miami Basel <clears throat> and Cecilia was the conceptor of this exhibition that I got to be invited to take part of um, a little bit early on in the process. But, you know, I always love how Cecilia mentions about thinking about the Chica next body and how this specific exhibition is focused on kind of centering the lowrider because the lowrider is such an important com component of our community and how it gives us access um, and safety and guidance to certain spaces um, 
that we are not welcomed in, but also um, it's also a mode of us to express ourselves and through these glitz and glam of chrome details, pinstripe. And this piece, I think by Rafa is amazing for us to have. And I'm so appreciative that it's going to be part of this exhibition because it really shows the full circle of Rafa's body, brown body, being transformed into this low rider um, type mobile that is also playing with, um, you know, the, the kind of um, toy rides that we see outside of supermarkets. So thinking of like urban context to, um, yeah. So I think I just want to end on one final note that being, um, like the three main lessons I've taken away um, from my eight years of curating is one to listen, to listen, to learn, to see how you take up space, um, how the artists take up space, who needs to be part of the conversation, um, to think about collaboration um, beyond just co-curating. It's like, you know, I think it's important for curators, especially if you're curating alone, to think about how you're collaborating with others on your team specifically how works get installed, um, to think about your, you know, the full team that is involved in this, the, the person that is delivering the, the artwork, um, the person that is um, writing the press release for the artwork, you know, all those components, I think sometimes can be overlooked. Um, it's very important to kind of be mindful of that and think of collaboration, not just be between the artists and you, but also um, with you and the other, um, team members that you have access to. And then lastly, to accept your value and worth and to know what your value and worth is. Um, I think that's what I've been learning a lot um, these past couple of years, um, you know, since the pandemic and, you know, learning how to be an advocate of, you know, demanding your value and worth and getting what you want, um, still being flexible, but understanding that, you know, sometimes you just won't take less than, and um, yeah, I think that's where I want to end. So thank you all. Thank you, Marisa. That was such a touching uh, presentation. And I, I want to see <clears throat> just as a coda to um, the fact that we are co-curating an exhibition that Larissa has been incredible in the project because when uh, the project started a little bit earlier than she uh, in, was incorporated because the show was going to take place at the Phoenix Art Museum. So Gilbert and Marisa became part of the curatorial team that there was a need for a, a broader, more contemporary, more sort of radical edges to the project. So um, what was the original checklist became something completely different. We did some studio visits together and she proposed always incredible artists. So it, it really has been um, an amazing project where I feel that the three curators actually have a voice. And, um, and I am at a point in my life where I don't really want to work closely with people unless I feel that we can work together without it being a force exercise, without having to fight for your place. I just feel that curating, especially a project like this, which has been a long term, we've had to go through a lot of um, difficulties, you know, with lack of jobs and homes and whatever, you know, it's been really hard for the three of us that, you know, on top of that is not a situation of the typical competition of the art world because somehow which is what will lead me to a question for Marisa mm -hmm. so the art system in general is complicated because it's replicated in many ways both the museums and the way we even from the moment we are studying universities work in a sort of a corporate type of mind no there is a competition and a way to do things where there is a sense that unless you fight hard for things, you don't go anywhere. And I know on the one hand, we do need to you know, take our place and, and have our worth and, and demand something, but that's different from 
competing in a way that actually may hurt other people. I think one of the mottos I have is whenever I am getting a benefit from something, I think, am I doing this at the expense of someone else? Or, I, you know, that is always the biggest question at the beginning because I don't want that to be at the expense of artists, other curators or whatever, you know, so there is a sort of an ethical question here. So my biggest, you know, for me, I mean, I have my own answer to this, but I'm always intrigued when someone like you, who you, you're the first person in your family that has actually been, you know, committed to art in the way you are. You're a person that really believes in a sense of justice and you have all these really kind of strong principles that art can be equated to an experience which is nurturing, caring, human, that brings us forward. So, but that is not the obvious way to see it because the way the art world portrays this is absolutely the opposite. You know, for me, it's always been being close to artists. Artists are the ones that lead the way, but art is not the obvious way to fight for all these things. So I want to understand how did you, how did you become, you know, how did you choose art and pursue art in the way you do, thinking that it's pivotal, important, central, to this other human project that you're developing and the sort of this radical imagination you're proposing, you know, through the words of Esteban Lopez yeah. or whatever. Yeah, Esteban Munoz. Um, I think it was um, my family. So I know they're not artists or art centered in the traditional sense, but, you know, I saw my grandparents how um, like, how art centric they were in the little ways that were every day. You know, um, my grandpa making little adobe blocks um, just for random like things he would make around the yard. Um, my grandmother's like crafting and like um, sewing and crocheting and like teaching me too. And it was also because like, yeah, they were raised that way because they couldn't afford to go buy a brand new blank at the time, but you know, like it just became a thing. Um, so being raised that way and like I think my mother was a big part of that too and like the sense like a lot of our stuff was crafted um, beautifully and like put together beautifully um, but so that I think makes me look at art as being like an everyday accessible thing already and I think it, it poses like the traditional sense and that's what's taking me time to like really look at and learn um, but I think I also want to give credit to my older sister, Dina. Um, she passed away when she was young, um, but she was a storyteller and Dina was an amazing storyteller. And I would listen to her stories and she would, she taught us how to storytell too. Um, so for me, I guess I became a storyteller to continue her legacy and my love for her. Um, because Dina had like a really great um, attitude and like she was sick most of her life. I'm going, I'm getting a little emotional, but she was sick most of her life and um, she always had hope. Um, so uh, I think that's why like, I'm always like striving for hope even in the darkest moments um, because, and even in the nefarious like art world um, for justice and hope and treating people equitably and respectfully, because that is what Tina taught me. Um, so yeah, I don't know if that makes sense, but <laughs> it's my answer. And I think that's like, you know, I like I know the art world is so competitive with each other. I just, I really don't understand it. It For me, that also, I think there's like something inherent, maybe this is my Sagittarius Pisces, I don't know. But I'm like, why are we competing with each other? We can just work together. And yes, there will be miscommunications. We'll get in disagreements. We'll like have hurt feelings, but we can, you know, either decide to like move on from it or like try to talk it out like it's not going to be perfect I'm not a perfect um you know so I just I the main, main person I compete with is myself um and sometimes that's good sometimes that's bad I'm working on that self-care and making sure it's balanced but um yeah I really don't care for the art world competition um you know, I understand there's always going to be critiques. There's definitely critiques of my work and I welcome them. Um, and I love to engage with them. But, you know, I think um, 
when it becomes like a toxic com competition where it's, it's kind of pointless. I don't see the point in it. I don't see it being productive or um, being fulfilling for my life. I mean, I totally agree with you. I mean, the idea of art I have, I mean, I always say that it's a low art, non-canonical, and is born in a thousand ways. And much of the expressions that I care for are not the one that are represented in the art world. Or that are not even considered art as such, you know, your story about, you know, the craftiness of your grandmother and so forth, which that, that's really the, the whole principle that art at a really deep level is like the vertebra of our lives, you know, mm -hmm. the, the fact that we, it is, I always say that more than um, art, I talk about the sort of an aesthetic impulse that has existed since ever. It's never been about, you know, being present in the art world or no. I mean, I read the statistic once, something like 98% of the art produced in the world is never shown in a museum, yeah? Because a lot of people make art, however you want to define it. So I do understand that there is, um, is a way, is an inspiring way to live and is an inspiring way to collaborate and open to other, other people. You know, when we think of the pandemic, I mean, listening to your talk, you know, if I want to look at what happened in the last few years, I look at artists, artists' mm -hmm. responses, you know, they're already so, such a way step ahead because it's not just a purely intellectual process, isn't it? It's something that goes beyond that. It's, it, yeah. Um, and I think this is if you're thinking about it, that um, I think this, like, you know, the current calls for change with the museums, I think, you know, it's nothing new specifically, like this has been going on for decades, um, you know, about showing more artists of color, um, having more curators of color. And I think it's still important to keep pushing for that, you know. Um, but I think it's like a good reminder like that, like art has always been accessible and always been part of like our everyday lives. It's just been these institutions that have been predominantly held by like white individuals, you know, um, by like white supremacy at the end of the day um, that has just positioned certain levels of fine art um, as not including BIPOC, you know, artists. Um, and that's why we have this disparity that we're trying to rectify now. And, and I think it's doable. I think it's, but it's just a matter of like, um, actually just committing to the change of like being like inclusive and not being like racist or anti-black or, you know, anti-immigrant or, you know, homophobic. Like it's just, and those are hard changes because that's like what I think this country is struggling with at this current time, if we can't talk about it politically, but it's also like within the museum world too. Um, it's just like a hard, it's just hard conversations that we have to have with ourselves together, but then also like at the end of the day, we got to make sure like um, that like this change is implemented, you know? And like, again, it's those moments where I mentioned like certain people need to like make sure, check their like space that they're taking up, you know? Or like, have they been in this conversation for too long? Should I give my space to someone else, you know, like who doesn't look like me or, you know, doesn't talk like me, you know, what, what other conversations we can bring to the fore um, because they're out there. They just haven't been given that platform. And I think also giving props to the spaces that have been giving that voice and platform for those artists who have, you know, thinking about all, um, the small community centers, um, small art nonprofits that like give that platform, you know, cause like a lot of those institutions are doing the work that I think bigger institutions later take up, um, you know, down the line. But I think we need to give more props to the small nonprofit and art museums that are kind of doing the hard work of like actually making culture for this country. I don't know if any of you would like to pose a question to Marisa. You can do it either by putting it on the chat or just um, um, unmuting yourself. We have a few more minutes. Um, um, well, I have a question. Um, I'm 
question. I'm oh. fine, Teresa. It's nice to meet you. Um, <laughs> that was a fantastic presentation, and I'm really looking forward to visiting it next to the next month. Um, I'm really excited. I thought that so many of the points that you made and like honestly the radical like vulnerability that you shared with us today was just really inspiring to hear at this point especially like researching all of these different institutions that sort of say that they do what you and like your community are actually doing so um thank you for sharing with us um and I was wondering what have been the responses that you've received from like other museum professionals or directly the community in New Haven or even the artists that you work with with the process of interacting with Next Haven versus like a more traditional institution? Mm. Well, I, I like to say like, you know, um, Next Haven's a wonderful place, you know, it's not perfect because it's run by humans. We're human at the end of the day. Um, but I think in the sense that because it is not like a traditional um, institution, like a museum, um, and because it is very close, like I think that is where the, the change, you know, um, you're able to have like these conversations um, and be vulnerable, you know, like I think the during the sessions, there's moments definitely of where people become vulnerable, the fellows, the um, the participants that share their, um, their wisdom. Um, so I think that's like, and I think that's like, it, it takes time to process that too. And I say like, I think that is like kind of maybe also the difference between like or a different residency. Um, I'm just being of myself, like from the, as a fellow, you know, um, not as a staff right now, but I think because of that experience, like you go into it and it's, it is kind of tough to be vulnerable in that moment. And I think from, I think all residencies have some kind of plus to them, you know, some great thing quality about them. But I would say it's like, just also the time and space to like, just think about these feelings, you know. Um, this year, actually, we, um, Next Haven provided the current cohort of fellows like with um, counseling sessions, which I think is wonderful. Cause like, I'm like, I would love if I had a curatorial like fellowship that offered me counseling sessions <laughs> to process like the trauma of working in white predominantly like institutions, you know? Um, so, and yeah, and it, it, I think it's a wonderful thing to like think about. And like, I think that's also one of the great things about Next Haven too, is like, we're always like taking feedback. So like, <laughs> if something didn't go right this year, we'll like make sure like next year it's like changing and shifting. We're always growing and learning. Um, but yeah, I guess that would be like, kind of like the big takeaway is that I, as a fellow, and I think what I've heard from other responses of visitors is that like, um, it's such a great space, like to have, you know, like, um, they pay, they give a stipend for the 10 months and like subsidized housing and really nice. Not a lot of residencies do that, you know, not a lot of fellowships do that too. So thank you. If there is no other question, Marisa, I would like to ask you one last question, which has to do with the fact that you've worked in a really very broad spectrum of institutions from being a fellow with the Getty, Phoenix Art Museum, Santa Barbara, and then um, as an independent curator, and then also you've done projects with galleries, you know, these galleries that you that you work with uh, big galleries, yeah, the mm -hmm. Gagosian or whatever, I mean, they're they like what we call blue chip galleries. Yeah, blue. Mm -hmm. And then you are in Next Haven and then you maintain this sort of sense of you are still an independent curator. You're still yourself as an individual first and everything. So how, you know, I, I'd just like to understand how, what is your perspective within the sort of broad, brush stroke of having had the experience of and you know how do you feel it makes more sense for example for you or you know also in terms of thinking your next steps in the future you know would you like to be in a big museum or building a grassroots foundation or I don't know I know I always feel like I always get like stuck on the questions like where do you see yourself in the future because like 
I don't know. Like I, the main thing for me is like, I just want to keep telling stories. Um, that's what I see my role is. Um, yeah, I know I've worked with like, especially this past year, blue chip galleries. Um, and I never really, I never saw myself doing that ever. Like, you know, who would kind of, um, but I think I make sure that I stay true to myself by the way I engage with them, like making sure that like, um, you know, I don't sell art, I sell stories. So that's what I get paid for. I get paid for my stories. Um, and if I can encourage artists to get paid for their artwork, making sure like they're getting a fair deal <laughs> um, by their agreements, you know, like if it is 50-50, what are you getting out of it? So I think that's how I stay true to myself, making sure that the knowledge I share and what I think is equitable. Um, you know, I always share my advice and it can be taken or not. Um, I try to encourage people to like find the confidence to again, find their value and worth um, and stay flexible. Cause you're not going to always get hundred percent what you want at the door, you know, but um, you know, if an artist is, I've had artists come up to me, like tell me about the deals are kind of being served from galleries about their gallery wants to charge them um, will not pay for shipping, wants them to ship their work, artwork, wants them to install their artwork, but yet they want 50-50. I'm like, no, that's ludicrous. Like, and it happens across so many, so many times. And I'm telling artists, like, you can you can negotiate your contract. You need to look at your contract. You need to know what's written down. Even for curators too, you need to know what's in your contract and your agreement and stick to like what you do and what you don't do because everyone will try to like um get more from you, you know, and that's up to you to decide if you want to get more or not, you know, outside of that. Um, but I think that's probably like my union, um, my union side for my dad influencing that part of like knowing what you're working for. Um, but yeah, I think it's again, important to know your value and worth. And I think that's what keeps me, um, like engaged. Um, so I don't become consumed from the nefarious side. Cause I don't know. I don't, for me, it's all useless and um, not productive. Um, so yeah, I do want to answer one question that popped up in the chat before we go. I know we we're kind of over, but um, Claudia, this is from you. I think um, you're asking like, how do I balance showcasing the voices of others while staying true to my own voice and story and how much of my own voice is infused in the work? Um, do you ever have to pull it back? I'd say, um, yeah, I've kind of thought about that because like, I always think like the my my voice is shown through the style of how the artwork show up and the dialogue that you know the conversation of the artworks and how they're laid out you know um, but also like in the crafting of that story um, again it's like the artist that's the platform you know I'm giving them um, and it it it's, can be a struggle I guess at times. Um, doesn't feel like it though, but I guess at times it can be a balance of like a struggle for balance to make sure like my voice I'm still seen, but like for me, it's all about making sure the artists come first, you know? Um, Cause that's the point of me doing this work of telling these stories via artworks and paintings and visual methods. Um, and, you know, I always make sure like, yes, I get credit for my curatorial work. I think I've learned a lot the hard way of when I don't and it hurts. Um, so I advise others, especially as aspiring curators to make sure that you do get credit for the work you do. Um, but yeah, I think it's again, that moment of making sure like taking a step back or in, you know, to assess like how much of yourself is involved in this and do you need to add more? Um, and like, I don't think I've ever really had to pull back because I think I've been pretty good. And also it, it's kind of organic because when you work with artists, um, you know, that's like the negotiation, the conversations that you have with them and like, how do they want to present your, their work, you know? And like, sometimes those become hard discussions, like, because they sometimes want to do something so massive and explosive and you're like, love it but I got a small budget and we got this small space. So let's make it happen in this little, <laughs> you know, we'll do it a squatchy style, but it will still be magnificent, but it'll be this size. <laughs> so like, those are just reality. Um, and that's just the balance you have to do. Um, but yeah, hope that answered your question. 
Thank you. Uh, you know, Marisa, I always think that uh, one of the ways that I, I ask when I'm curating, especially collective work, and I say, do I speak for someone else or do I speak with someone else? Because it's very different when you are with someone as opposed to say, I'm speaking in your name, you know, which is the sort of tokenizing situation that happens often when you mm -hmm. in museums, uh, others are represented and there is a bunch of tropes being piled on them. So it's really kind of sense of respect. And I agree with you in the sense of, you know, artists come first. That is the center of everything. Yeah. And then everything stems from that. Um, yeah. I think uh, Rasquacha style, yes. Marisa, it has been uh, truly wonderful. I mean, I, I feel that when I hear someone like you, it sort of restores, not that I've lost my sense, but it's nice um, to have a sense of we are entitled, we have a right to be human, to feel that they can, you know, there, there is joys and purpose. And because a lot of the time what happens with the art world is that curators, when they are, a little bit idealistic and so forth, they get burnt on the way because this sense of self-care that you propose towards others, towards yourself is not there. So there is a sacrifice that in the end becomes a colonial affirmation again. So it's, it's the fact that you are always so careful about, you know, sort of a sense of worth and everything at the sense of I'm giving it to others. So I think that makes a very big difference. And it creates a sort of a, a balance of knowing that there is a possibility of you being the human that is interactive with other human, interactive with an institution without losing their humanities and their rights. Mm -hmm. And I think you actually really embody that in a really powerful way. So it's really amazing. Well, thank you, Cecilia. And thank you all for being here for this yes. conversation. Thank Loved you. All thank the you, everybody. So we see you soon. Marisa, see yeah. you soon. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Bye. Goodbye. Yeah. Bye.